Okay, first of all, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And uh, thank you to all of you for coming here in such big numbers. This is really amazing. Um, I have good news and bad news. Okay, the good news is functional programming is really hot. It's taking off, right? And, and you are uh, the proof of this. Um, and this is really something that, that, that's been changing for the last few years. This is a very quick uh, revolution or takeover of power in the programming community. The functional program is becoming so important. Uh, the bad news is uh, I'm going to talk about the next thing. Okay, so prepare. <laughs> Prepare yourself for another revolution. I don't know how fast it will come or how, uh, how soon it will come, but um, I think the next revolution is, is going to be uh, going back to mathematics and going back to category theory. And, and, and this is uh, parts of this talk I, I, I gave to uh, uh, C++ programmers. So I have lots of examples in, in C++. You can probably uh, imagine them in Java or in other imperative languages. The point is that functional programming doesn't have to be done in Haskell, uh, although it's a preferred language for functional programming, according to me. <laughs> but, but you don't have to, and uh, you can try doing this uh, uh, in, in other languages, and you can have uh, some limited success in, in doing this. And of course, uh, uh, you, you won't have all these uh, safety measures that you have in, in Haskell or in, in other functional languages. Uh, but uh, it's probably easier, right, to introduce it into your work environment. <clears throat> so let me, let me start by... Uh, and func functional programmers, um, they often, when, when they approach a problem, um, they start with, with uh, some very, very general questions, and like, what is the meaning of life? Or what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? So since, since my talk is very general, I will start with uh, asking myself this question, what is programming, right? Um, and, and probably most uh, engineers will say um, programming is, is about you know, telling the computer to do some stuff, right? Move the bytes, uh, do some multiplications, and so on, right? But there is this other side that I think is much more important, and that's the human side of, of programming. We are humans, and we have to know what to tell the computer to do, right? And why. We know why we are telling the computer what, what to do, right? So um, we, are, we are solving problems. Computers are just tools for us to solve problems. So how do we approach problem solving as humans, not as computers? Well, we have these brains of ours that were um, developed, evolved uh, to chase animals, organize hunting parties, uh, this kind of stuff, right? Shoot arrows. And now we are faced with computers and we have to program them, right? So um, our, our brains are not really similar to computers. Our brains have have this funny limited cap capability. Like, there, uh, we have this short-term memory, the cache in our brains, right? That, that can only um, fit uh, a few uh, concepts at a time. There, there was even a, a paper, in, I, I think in the 60s or something, uh, the magical number seven plus minus two that, that claimed that we can only keep about seven ideas in, in our minds at the same time. I don't know how true this paper is and it was criticized, but there is something to it, right? Um, we, we cannot deal with tremendous complexity. 
What we do with complexity, we chop it into pieces, right? We develop some kind of procedure to uh, decompose a bigger problem into smaller problems. And then we solve these smaller problems one at a time, and then we have to recompose the solutions. So I propose that programming is about composition. And, um, and who knows best about composition? Musicians, right? They are the composers. They, they've been composing stuff forever. So let me talk about how musicians approach this. So these are, these are two um, representations of the same piece of music by um, Johann Sebastian Bach. Okay? And you probably can't hear this, but... So this is what Bach was hearing in his head, or maybe then he set at an instrument that play, played this, right? And what kind of notation did he use? He didn't use this notation. This is, this, this is just bytes. This is the sampling of sound, right? This is very, very low level. He used this kind of notation. This is the standard musical notation, right? And it's very abstract. It, has, it, it divides problem into smaller problems that can be dealt with individually. There are abstractions like notes, right? There are uh, these letters here, E, A, B7. They, they talk about harmony, right? There is melody. There is bass line. So he was able to decompose the problem that he had in his mind into these elements and then recompose. And this is what he composed. He composed this music, right? And as um, programmers, we we often deal with uh, this kind of representation, very low level. We go into programming and, and start programming very low level, especially you know, C++ or C programmers, they, they will they program down to the metal. And, and they will also use uh, uh, the techniques that are used uh, in dealing with sample, sampled sound, like, uh, you know, like rap musicians, they would sample something, then they would cut it into pieces, and copy and paste stuff, right? We've seen this in programming too, copy and paste programming, right? Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. But what, what we would really like to be able is, is to, to, to be like, like Bach, right? Write our programs in this uh, high level and, and, and make these, these beautiful programs that, 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 that will survive for centuries. So as programmers, uh, we can't really use musical notation, right? We have to look for uh, our abstract language somewhere else. And, and there is one branch of mathematics that's perfect for this. It's category theory. Category theory is all about composition, exactly the problem we are trying to solve. So let me introduce category theory to you. And uh, this is embarrassingly simple concept, okay? I mean, category theory is not an easy uh, theory if you get in depth into it. But it's, it's based on very, very simple concepts. So I'll start with introducing a category. What is a category? Category is just two things, objects, and arrows between objects. That's it. Okay? And we don't ask what these objects are. These are just objects. We just call them A, B, C, D, you know, and, uh, and the arrows, what are arrows? The only thing we know about arrows is that every arrow has to start at some object and uh, end in some, at some object. That's all. There could be many arrows going between two objects. There could be none, and so on. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the picture we have. It's sort of like, like a graph. But I said it's about composition. 
So the most important property of these arrows, that's part of the definition of the category, is that arrows compose. Okay? So if we have two arrows going from object A and ob to object B, represented as piggies here, and one from object B to object C, then there must be a composition of these two, another arrow that goes directly from A to C. And it's called the composition of these two. And now again, because we don't ask what arrows are, because they are abstract thingies, right? We don't ask what composition is. Composition just is. It says we have two arrows and, and they are composable, meaning the end of one is the beginning of the other. Then there is a composition of these two in the category, always, right? So these, these arrows, we usually um, name them like F that goes from A to B. We have G that goes from B to C. And the composition is, uh, this is pronounced G after F. That's, that's the composition of these two. And it goes from A to C. And there's one important property that's imposed on it, that's associativity, so that we don't really need parentheses when we have more than two um, arrows, we just say F after G after H, and that's enough, no, enough information. And there's one more thing that every category has to have, and that's an identity for every object. There has to be an arrow that goes back to the same object. So it's, it's a loop, right? It starts at A and ends at A, right? And it has this property, like, sort of like multiplication by one. That's why it's called um, identity. Like, if you have an arrow that goes to, to, uh, from object A, then you can impose it on, uh, compose it with ID, and you get the same arrow back. Okay? And, and the other way around. If you have uh, an arrow that goes into the object A, ID after G is the same as G, okay? And, and let me give you immediately a, a, an, an example that's an extremely simple example of a category um, that, that you know and you have used it uh, many, many times, but you probably didn't realize that it was a category and that it had a name, <clears throat> and it's called a monoid. And it's, again, an embarrassingly simple uh, concept. Uh, it's a category that has just one object. Okay? It can have many arrows and usually has infinitely many arrows in, in many cases, but it has just one object. So every arrow in this category, by necessity, must uh, be begin at the same object and end at the same object because there is only one object. And therefore, every arrow is composable with any other arrow, because the beginning of one is always the end of some other, right? So all arrows are composable, composable, and one of these arrows, by definition of category, one of these arrows must be an identity, because there is an identity arrow for every object. So we have all these arrows, and one of them is an identity. Okay, maybe you don't recognize this yet, or maybe you do, because the, the examples are uh, um, many and uh, very simple. Um, the example of a monoid is, is uh, n numbers, let's say natural numbers, with addition, and the identity arrow is adding zero, right? So each arrow there corresponds to adding something. You know, is, there is an arrow for adding five, there is an arrow for adding uh, six, and there is an arrow that's a composition of these two, and it will be an arrow for adding 11, right? And the arrow for adding zero is an identity, right? There is a multiplication um, monoid where uh, multiplication by a number is the arrow, and multiplication by one is the identity. Right? And then there is string concatenation, also something very, very useful in programming. We do it all the time. And uh, uh, concatenation of strings and the uh, identity is an empty string. You concatenate empty string to something 
you get back the same string. Now, there's a difference between string concatenation and these other monoids is that uh, the string monoid is, is just purely a monoid. This has no, no more structure than just a monoid because, for instance, it doesn't have uh, a negative, right? There is no anti-world string that when you append to hello world, you'll get back hello, right? For these other monoids, you have actually inverses, so they, they are not, not only monoids, they are also groups, right? Or at least when you extend them. <clears throat> but we see monoids much more often in programming without thinking that the, about this. Every time you have something like logging information, gathering data, or auditing, and I'll give you an example of auditing, um, when you have to add something to your log or to your trail, audit trail, you know, this operation of adding some information and gathering it is a monoid. And there's always some kind of empty information that you can append. If you have nothing to append, then you use the identity. Okay. But there is another category that's even more interesting for us as programmers, and that's the category of types and functions. This is what we use every day in programming, and it, they form a category. Okay? This, this category mathematically is uh, approximated by the category of sets, because a type can be understood as a set of values of a given type. So like a Boolean is a set of true-false. Integer is a set of, of integers, right? Uh, every type can be understood as a set. Uh, so our objects in, in this category are types or sets of values. Arrows are functions, okay? Because functions go from one type to another, so they connect types. You know, the argument is of type A, the result of a function is of type B. So a function connects two types, so it's an arrow. And there is a composition of function, um, and it's just, you know, one, uh, call one function, get the return value, and pass it as an argument to another function. That's composition, that's, that's function com functional composition. Um, I, I wrote it here in, in, in C++ for C++ programmers and, and I wrote it, well, I wrote it in Haskell here and, and I translated it from C++ to Haskell in the, the hard way, right? So that, that's what, in, in Haskell this is really a dot. Composition is just dot, that's all. So that's, that tells you, you know, a functional language will have things that you do with functions using the simplest possible syntax, whereas the syntax of other languages uh, is, is kind of awkward when dealing with, with functions. But you can always do the same, uh, almost always you can do the same thing in, in, in all languages. Now the thing about these functions that go between uh, types and between sets, like if, if, if we really think about this, uh, in mathematics a function is it's just a mapping from one set to another. Um, so these, these are very special functions. These are functions that are called pure functions, right? They cannot have any side effects. So we have a theory of pure functions, and, and this is what we use in functional programming, right? But this is not what people use in, in other types of programming. They don't use pure functions. They use, pure, use, use functions with side effects. Uh, so just, just a quick summary what a pure function is. Well, it cannot have any side effects. It cannot, um, when it's called with the same arguments, it will return the same values always, right? So that's, that's called referential transparency. And, and because of that, it can be memoized. You can, like, if you have a function that takes a long time to evaluate something, you know, you can, you can just remember the value and next time it's called, you just look it up. Right? Because you know, because of ref referential transparency, it will always return the same value. So once you calculate, you don't have to calculate the second time or third time, right? And, 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 and 
another extremely important thing that may, may people don't realize how important it is, is that um, the only dependencies in your code when you are doing functional composition are through composition, right? It's, it's unlike in, in uh, uh, languages when, when, you don't, when you have um, functions with side effects, right? If you have two function calls, that are not composed. So they calculate completely different things. And you have them one after another in your program, right? If these are pure functions, you can, you can reverse their order. It doesn't matter which one is calculated first, right? There is no dependency between these functions. You can call the first one first and the second one second, and, or you can do the opposite way, and, and still you get the same result every time, right? It's not true. If, if your function has side effects, you, you invert them and you invert the, the, the order of side effects and if the second function depends on the side effects of the first function, um, you're wrong, right? So in, in a functional program, composition will show you the dependencies. There are no other dependencies but composition, okay? And now, uh, you know, if, when I talk to uh, imperative programmers, this is, this is the point at, at which they, they, their eyes glaze over and, and they say, okay, this is totally useless, right? We cannot program without side effects. Programming is about side effects, right? So please don't talk to us about pure functions. Talk to us about side effects. And it's true, yes, programming is about side effects, but before we get to running, we have to learn how to walk. This is why pure functions are so important, okay? Because once we understand pure functions, then we can start talking about side effects. And they are possible in functional languages. If they were not possible in functional languages, then we would not be able to use functional languages anywhere in programming. Right? So let's talk about side effects. Now that we know about uh, pure functions. And I'm going to give you an example instead of explaining the, the theory of side effects uh, in category theory and in mathematics and so on. I'm just going to give you one very simple example of how a prob problem that normally would be solved using side effects can be solved using pure functions and what the technology is, is behind it, okay? So this example is about auditing. It's a programming uh, problem. So you have a sequence of functions, right, that uh, <coughs> you want to compose. So you have a function get key and that takes a password, maybe a string, right, and gives you some key, maybe an integer. And then <coughs> you have another function that takes a key and then withdraws money, so it returns you money. Maybe it's, it's a double, say, or something. It doesn't matter, right? It, what, what matters is these are two functions. <clears throat> they are composable, right? Let's assume that they are pure, just for simplicity, right? And now I want to start adding side effects to these functions. Um, and the side effect uh, that, that, that um, my manager asked me to add is, uh, you know, uh, we, are, we have this banking system and, and we have to uh, have an audit trail for every transaction. So every function like get key or withdraw should produce a, an audit trail so that we know what things happen in what order and, and just remember the important information about each step that, that happened, right? Um, so the simplest solution that immediately comes to mind to every to the mind of an imperative programmer is global variable, right? Let's have a global variable, a string, for instance. That's the audit trail. That's the log to which we are going to append our information. And, and like in C++, that's, that's a um, normal thing because this is how you, how you do input-output, right? You have a global object C out and CN, right? And, and nobody complains about this, 
So a global object is, is fine, right? So this is Im implementation number one, and it's not pure functions because they have side effects, right? They have the side effect of appending something to this global string, audit, right? So they do their own thing, which here, I'm, just for simplicity, I'm, I'm just returning some random um, values. That, that doesn't matter. But what they do is they append the string password to audit, and this one appends the string withdrawing to the audit. Now, for many reasons, we know that this is a mm, bad solution, right? Because we know that global variables are bad and, and ugly. But, but, uh, but is there really a reason why this is so bad? The, the real reason is that this, this uh, solution doesn't scale, and the maintenance of, of this solution is a nightmare, and it's very inflexible. I mean, suppose that you want just the simplest thing, you know, you want refactoring, okay? How many times do you want to change the name of a variable? And you say, I can't change this, the name of this variable because it's everywhere. So try changing the name of, of audit, right? Here we have only two functions, but suppose you have hundreds of these functions in your banking uh, system, right? Uh, and, and suppose that's, that you want to add some more information to your audit trail, maybe not only a string, but also a timestamp, right? You want to accumulate timestamps. Well, then you have to rewrite all your functions, right? The whole library of functions will have to be rewritten. And I'm not even mentioning, you know, concurrency, right? If you have concurrency in your system, then you're totally host because, you know, you're accessing this, this variable from multiple threads. So let's try a different solution. This is like purely functional solution um, that um, uh, uses pure functions, okay? Uh, so the idea is that if, if you want to modify some state, well then pass this state as an argument to your function and return the modified state with, together with your return value. So this is what, what I did here, right? So the audit string is no longer a global variable. It doesn't have to be. It's just being passed in as an additional argument, and then it's returned through a pair. So I'm making a pair. Whatever my previous value was, like an, the key or the money sum or whatever, you know, I'm returning this, but I'm pairing it with a string. And the string is uh, the concatenation of what the audit tray that I got as an argument plus whatever I'm appending to it, okay? So this is a better solution in the sense that it's, these are pure functions, right? And, and concurrency will work with this, no problem. Um, but, but it's, uh, hmm, it doesn't memoize, for instance, that well, okay? I mean, yeah, you can memoize these functions because they are pure, but it's like every time you get uh, this, the same password will give you the same key, probably, right? But now you have the second variable that's the audit tray, the, the history of everything that happened before, right? So if you want to memoize this function, you have to memoize the value of the, of the uh, key for every possible history of previous calls because that's the argument to this function. That's, that's totally impractical, right? But there is also a more, um, a deeper problem with this. Um, um, well, one is security, right? These, these functions have access to the audit trail. So like, this function can look up what was the password of the guy who called me, right? So that, that's not really good. Um, and. Um, and also these functions now have knowledge of stuff like concatenation, how the logging works, you know, how, how do you concatenate the log um, that you have to use this plus uh, operator on strings and so on. And if you want to modify your log to in include something else, then uh, you would have to like, modify. So now I'm going to propose a, a solution uh, that uh, maybe would not immediately come to mind 
to an imperative programmer, and it's sort of in between these, well, not between these, it's sort of like this, but with a twist, okay? So we will, we will leave this pairing of, um, of the return value, the previous return value with a string, but we will not pass in the audit uh, string, okay? So, so now it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nicer because it's separated. Every function rep, um, only, only has its local state and local information. It doesn't have access to like the history of the log. It, it just knows that this function, the first function wants to um, pair the password with uh, whatever value it returns. The second one wants to pair withdrawing, right? They do their own thing. Only this function knows what it wants to log, right? But it doesn't have access to the log. It just returns it, right? The thing with this solution, is th though, is, is that, well, how do we compose these functions? Well, previously, we knew how to compose functions because the next function was taking the same arguments as the previous one was returning. And this is not true here. Right? This function returns a pair of, of uh, integer and string, but this one takes an integer. What do we do with this string? Right? So let, let me um, um, like clean up this code a little bit and, and say, let me, let me introduce some abstraction. Let, let's say this pairing of uh, um, a, a value with a string, I'll, I'll um, call this a writer. Okay, and, and this, this is what it's called in, in functional programming, it's a writer thingy, okay? So for every type, like if I have a library of these functions that deal with banking, right? For every type, return type, I can embellish it by pairing it with a string. So I'll call it embellishment, okay? And I define here uh, uh, this, this type mapping mapping of types. For any type A, um, I have a new type that's uh, defined as a pair of this type and a string. So this is an embellished type. So now my functions log in and withdraw, they, they are functions that return this embellished type. So it's important how, how I transform my code, right? I started with functions log in and withdraw that were just returning their stuff and now I'm embellishing them by adding to changing the return type. And now I'm asking the question, how do I compose these, these functions? And, and, and here's, here's how you would compose these functions. It's kind of easy, you know. So let's, let's say you, have, uh, you want to uh, write, uh, implement a transaction. And this transaction um, is just the two functions composed, right? So you call the first function, login with the password, returns you a pair, okay? The first element of this pair is, is the key. So you can call the second function with this p1 first. That's the, the key, right? And this one returns you a pair as well. And what you want to return from this transaction is this money that was returned as the first part of the pair from withdraw. So you, you return p2.first, that's the money amount. And now, you have these two messages from these two functions that were separate, right? They, that were, they were trying to contribute to, to the log, right? And you are concatenating them right here. So the concatenation, the, the creation of the log is external to the functions. It's a separate thing. It's sort of like it's accumulated between calls. If you think of composition as being something like an operator between, between the two calls. And in fact, you can take this code and you can abstract it and you can say, oh, I can do this for any two functions. So I have any two embellished functions that return a writer. Yeah, and notice the arguments and the return types. So one function takes A and returns writer of B. The second takes B and returns writer or C. And I compose them, and this is just the code that I wrote there, except that it's 
abstracted over these three types, A, B, and C, right? So now I have abstracted this, this part of, of my program that's, that's just pure composition. And with this composition, I can rewrite my transaction as a composition of login and withdrawal. So I just apply compose to these two functions, right? And I pass it the password, and, I will and it will return a writer of double. And this writer thingy will contain the money that I'm withdrawing, that's, that I was expecting, plus a log that consists of these two messages from these two functions. So it's a mini log of two things, right? And now you can see that if I keep using this composition between any two functions, that I will accumulate a log. But this accumulation of the log will happen between functions. It will happen in composition. The functions are now free. They don't have to deal with composing and they don't have access to the log. They just return their own string. And in C++, you can actually do even some kind of type inference, and that, that's for C++ programmers, that you, you, can, you can actually uh, implement it as a, as a lambda, this uh, composition. Okay, now back to categories, okay? So that was a very practical engineering example, and now I want to talk about categories. So let's, let's go back to what we, what we were talking about, the categories. So we had this category of, of data types and pure functions, right? And the composition was just passing the argument, uh, the return value of one function to another. But now we have something else. We have these embellished functions. We have these functions that return a writer, right? And, and we have this funny composition, right? The composition that does the concatenation of the logs. Okay, is this some kind of category? So how would we define this category? Well, the objects would still be these types, A, B, and C, right? Like integer, string, uh, double, and so on. But an arrow between two such objects, two such types, is not a function from A to B, function taking A, returning B, but the function that takes an A but returns embellished B. It returns a writer of B, and pairs it with a string, for instance, right? So now we have to define composition in this category. Right? So we have things like uh, an arrow from A to B is represented by a function from A to writer B, and so on. But we know how to do compose these things. I just showed you code that compose functions like these, right? So I have a category in which I have objects are types, arrows are embellished functions, and I have composition for them. And this is called a um, Kleisley category, and I'll, I'll explain in a moment um, what it means. This is the composition that I showed you before, and this is the identity. And notice uh, in, in, in composition, I'm using the plus sign to concatenate my strings, and um, in identity, I'm using the empty string to append to the log, right? So an identity just returns the value that was passed in, but pairs it with an empty string. So it, it does really nothing, but we need an identity to have a category. So what happened here is we, ha we found a way of controlling side effects. And it's a funny way of controlling side effects because we, ha we have pure functions, right? And side effects happen also in a pure way, but they happen in the composition. They happen in between, right? So we have suddenly discovered a new dimension to programming that we were not thinking. We are thinking functions, types, data, right? But there is this orthogonal uh, dimension of how do we compose functions. And it turns out that we have a lot of freedom in how we compose 
functions, how we glue them together. And this thing uh, suddenly um, generalizes in many directions. And one generaliz trivial generalization is, I can use a monoid here f instead of strings, right? Because the only thing I use is this plus an empty string. I can replace plus with whatever monoid uh, thing I, I have, an empty string with monoid identity, and, and still works, right? So maintenance of this program is now much easier because I understand that I can, I, it can work with, with any monoid, okay? Now let me show you some Haskell code just to show you how much easier it is to do this stuff in Haskell and, and because I can, I can talk about other Kleisley categories easier with, with Haskell and of course they can all be translated into C++. I don't know about Java but maybe, you know. So this is the writer type I can define in uh, um, in Haskell, and it's just a pair of whatever type A. A is a type, uh, arbitrary type. I pair it with a string. Uh, the composition, the composition is written using this operator. This is a funny operator called fish, the fish operator, <laughs> right? It, and it takes two functions from A to writer B, and another function from B to writer C, and returns a function from A to writer C. And this code is almost exactly the code that I wrote there in C++ for composition, right? It looks just simpler, easier, right? F acting on X returns a pair. G acting on Y, which is the first component of this pair, returns a pair. And this is the concatenation of strings, right? And this is my identity, it takes an X, returns X paired with an empty string. And transaction, the function transact, right? That's very easy also. I'm just doing login, fish, withdraw. <laughs> okay. Um, so so this, is, this is just one example. Uh, the, the, the writer, right? Are there more examples of this stuff? Like that we can, we can uh, put uh, side effects in, into composition? And yes, of course, there are many, many. Um, here's another example, list. You can embellish the return system of some uh, return type of functions by uh, turning them into lists of things, right? And this is an example of how you would def define a fish operator. Again, the concatenation, the, the um, composition of functions that return um, lists. And uh, if you stare at this long enough and then you translate this into C++, um, well, you find out that it's actually about nesting loops, okay? Because uh, um, um, a list corresponds to, um, to a loop as a data structure that corresponds to a construct called a loop. And if you have functions that take some value and turn it into a, a list, it, it's equivalent to having a loop uh, that goes over these values. And if you feed it to another uh, function, it's like having a nested loop, okay? And there's lots of other examples. And all these examples, now I can tell you what, what, they are, what, what this is called in, in functional programming. These things are called monads, okay? So these embellishments that I talked about, they are called monads. And, uh, and the category I was talking about is called the Kleisley category. It's a category that you can build on top of any monad, right? And this is the definition of, of the fish operator for, a, for an arbitrary monad. Now, if you know Haskell, you will recognize this immediately. If you don't know, that's, that's okay. Uh, here's the definition of, of, a, of a monad. And people don't use monads in C++ yet. Uh, at least they don't talk about it. <laughs> Except maybe at, at, at committee meetings where, where actually the word monad is now uh, openly admitted, you know, so you, you can, I, I mean, I use the word monad in, in, in C++ committee meetings and I was not 
uh, thrown out of the meeting. <laughs> so it's okay. And there are several proposals um, that are trying to solve problems like, uh, well, one example of a monad in C++ is, is the future. You know, like in concurrent programming, we, we have functions that return futures, uh, asynchronous functions, futures for, form a monad. And this is something that the committee did not realize before, and they, they screwed up C++ 11, because the support for, for futures is, is, is missing. There are a lot of functionality. So in C++ 17, this will be changed so that futures will become a monad. But really what they should do, and, and I advocate for this, is, is introduce monads into C++ so that many other solutions that can be, many other problems that can be solved using monads, and they should be used this, using the same mechanism. So here are my conclusions, okay? So if, if, if there is uh, one thing that, uh, that I would like you to remember is that programming is all about composition. This is, this is like very, very basic thing. And category theory is also about composition. So this is why I started advocating category theory. So after the functional revolution uh, functional programming revolution, this is going to be the next thing. So maybe, you know, you can start on it slowly, <laughs> you know, and, and, and eventually uh, we'll all get there. And um, we can start with pure functions, and when we want to introduce side effects, we can do this using these Kleisley categories and monads, and it's not really that hard. And um, I, just, I just hope um, that people will pick up on this. And um, I started writing this book about category theory uh, and uh, publishing it as posts in my blog. So if, if you want to learn more about category theory, I re read my blog. Uh, and maybe uh, you'll see that it's really not that complicated. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for a few questions? Or? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Do you, have, do you have any questions? Yes? Okay, the question is what, what more can we gain from category theory than uh, what's already in uh, algebra and set theory. Um, well, category theories, set theories is an example of, of one uh, uh, particular category that, that's uh, very useful in programming. But I showed you an example of another category that's, um, well, it's monoid. It, well, it's also, it can be represented as a set, right? Um, but things like, like, like monads, for instance, like functors, that's, that's something that does not exist uh, in, in set theory, okay? I, I haven't talked, I, I mean, I, there's not enough time to start even, even start talking about things like, like functors like um, natural transformations uh, that, um, that you have in, in category theory. I mean, it's just, just much, much larger reservoir or I of ideas than set theory. And from the perspective of mathematicians, 
The difference between category theory and set theory is like a difference between high-level language and assembly language. Set theory is like the assembly language of mathematics. So I think it's, it makes sense to, uh, to, to start from, from the top, from, from the, this abstract language. Okay, yes? Okay, so the question is, uh, uh, do, do I think that um, this category theory revolution will happen only in functional languages or will it also uh, involve imperative languages like C++, Java? Will they uh, maybe even get there faster than functional languages? Um, and probably not. I, I, I think this, this is... Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that imperative languages will die out. They won't. It, this, this, this will, this, it's sort of like a pyramid of languages, right? I mean, you will always have at the bottom, I'm, I'm not going to name the languages at the bottom because I don't want to offend any people. <laughs> right? And there's the, the Haskell at, at the top. <laughs> right? So, yeah, I, I think these ideas tend to percolate from, from the top to, to lower language. I mean, you can see how these ideas of functional programming are per percolating into uh, Java with lambdas in C++ with, with lambdas and, and other things, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I think there is, there is uh, the, uh, this, this process of ideas coming from category theory through functional languages and then going to. So I think functional languages play a very, very important role. Yes? Hey, in other functional languages, as a, for example, Clojure or other dynamic languages, you don't really see much talking about this, <coughs> this stuff. And mm -hmm. I wonder if it's because there is no explicit types, it's much harder to reason about this, or why, why do you think? Yeah, the question is about other functional languages, like Clojure, uh, that... Um, People don't talk about these things in, the, in those languages. Uh, and is it be because of uh, their uh, type system? And I, I think this is, yeah, that's, that's the reason. Uh, it's, it's not that it's impossible to implement these things in typeless languages or weakly typed languages, but like, a strong type system makes these things much, much cleaner. Right? I mean, I can talk about, I mean, what's, what's a functor in a, in a weakly typed language? I don't know. I mean, this embellishment, by the way, this is called a functor. A, a, a mapping from arbitrary type A to writer of A, or from A to future of A, that's called a functor. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's an operation on types. So if you don't have types, then... Um, then it's a very imprecise notion on what you mean by a functor. <laughs>